<laughs> okay, should we make a start? Um, yeah, why not? Join us. So let me do the housekeeping. So first of all, uh, my name is Sharon. I'm part of the Milton Keynes Literary Festival steering team. And um, I was asked to um, host this evening, which I'm absolutely thrilled to do. So because I've I've uh, known Peter for a little time. We don't know each other terribly well, but uh, really have enjoyed getting to know him a bit. And also on screen, you'll see John Best, who is um, leads the steering committee. And without him, I don't think Literary Fest would ever have got off the ground. And also Dave Wakeley, who is supporting this evening with the tech and just does so much behind the scenes. I absolutely adore him because he's one of these people who, when something needs doing, before anybody else can get to it, Dave's already done it. He's such a star. So uh, um, really great to be working alongside these guys. So um, do please um, join in with other things that Milton Keynes Literary Festival are doing. We have another event coming up in November. And but also just to say, you know, we really wanted to do face to face, but with the virus just wasn't possible, but it's great to have people online with us today. So. Please do use the chat um, facility to um, ask questions of Peter. I'm going to run this as a bit of a um, interview style this evening, um, but we'd really love to include your questions as we go along um, this evening. So pop your questions into the chat box and we'll try and keep an eye out for them. And also just need to tell you that we are recording this. So if you're not happy with being recorded, then please just feel free to turn your cameras off. Um, but if you are okay with that, then we'd really love to see your faces. So uh, I think that's probably everything that I need to say in terms of the administrative stuff. So let me introduce Peter Laws to you. So Peter is a man of many talents and interests and um, I've just discovered that there's so many things that this guy can do. He's an author, he's a journalist, he's a film cricket, critic, not a cricket, <laughs> critic, and he's a public speaker. And he's also an ordained minister, which, you know, there's just so many different things. And he has a real fascination for the macabre, which um, I think you will discover if you haven't come across his work and you're just joining us um, to find out more, then you will discover what he really likes. Um, in terms of the dark side of life. So as a novelist, the first of his, of his Matt Hunter novel series, Purge, was released in 2017, and that was followed by Unleashed in 2018 and Severed in 2019. And the fourth in the series called Possessed was published February of this year, all available in bookstores and online all over the place. He also writes it's for a monthly column for the Fortean Times, which is a monthly magazine of news, reviews and research into all sorts of strange phenomena and experiences. And uh, well worth a read if you've never come across it. It's a fascinating magazine. Plus, I don't know how he finds the time to do all of this. His acclaimed non-fiction book, The Frighteners, was released in the UK and the US in 2018 and is currently being translated into Chinese. I'm really curious as to why Chinese. I might ask that question later. <laughs> <laughs> and his latest project is a unique combination of his interests in faith, being a minister, and fear. And it's been described as Stephen King meets songs of praise. <laughs> I'm gonna show you a little bit of what that's all about. Dave's gonna share screen with us. Hang on a moment. Not just any church. Hi, everybody. This is Peter Laws introducing you to the Creepy Cove Community Church podcast. It's a podcast presented in the style of a church service, but not just any church. Creepy Cove is a mysterious haunted fishing town by the sea where every horror movie actually happened. Each show is an immersive audio experience where you attend the After Dark service. You'll be at the eccentric congregation. You'll get news from the town, including appearances from horror movie characters. There's a sermon to help you reflect in space for prayer and meditation. You'll also hear church music like you've never heard before. Treat this show as pure entertainment if you like. 
or as a genuine space for spiritual and philosophical pondering. It's designed to work as either. You don't have to be into church to come, and don't feel you have to listen to episodes in order either. Feel free to just scroll through and find a topic you like and drop right in. Or why not subscribe and get all new episodes sent straight to you for free? For more information, visit creepycove.com or find us at Twitter or Facebook. Just search for at creepycove. Thanks for listening. I look forward to seeing you at the next service of the Creepy Code Community Church. Okay, everybody, so let's give Peter Laws a really warm Zoom meeting welcome. <laughs> Peter, it's really, really great to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So let me kick off with a question and just ask you what made you come up with a podcast like creepy cove um well actually i mean the the idea came to me uh, at the beginning of lockdown because I'd, I'd had a new book come out uh, at the beginning of the year and i wasn't necessarily kind of ready to just rush straight into a new a new novel but at the same time um being an author, you know, you, you, you write, but you also go out and do sort of speaking engagements and, and just loads of those things got canceled. And so I found myself going, hang on, well, I'm not rushing into writing a new book straight away, but also I don't really have any events that I would normally go to happening. And I just felt, well, this is an opportunity to maybe try something different. And I came up with, well, I eventually came up with this idea of, um, of this Creepy Cove podcast. But the reason I came up with it was, well, it was two reasons really. One was I, I well, like, like many people who go to church um, during the lockdown, you weren't actually allowed to go to the building. And so I found myself sat at home, watching church at home in my pajamas, eating cereal. It was fantastic. It was even better, you know, <laughs> you know not, not having to sort of leave the house and, and, and watching it at home, like through a kind of mediated way, you know, on YouTube or online. And you would think, you would think that that would be a, a very substandard experience of something that's supposed to be spiritual or some, something that's supposed to be deep or community-based. But I, I was really surprised to find out how meaningful it, it still was, even though I was sat there and watching it on a screen and I thought, you know what, this, this is quite powerful. And then I also thought, but how come like loads of the people I know who never go to church, they, they don't get to have this experience during this weird time of a lockdown. So I started to think, well, what happens if I came up with a, a church service, but because it's not bound by geography, then therefore it's not even bound by reality. Like why, why not just make up, make up a town and, and make up a kind of a very specific style of church that appeals to a certain niche. And my interest and my niche, I suppose, is, is horror and, and the gothic and the spooky and the strange and the mysterious. And so I thought, well, let's try it. So I came up with this idea and created a podcast where the episodes feel and sound like you're listening to a church service. There's a you know, it's fully immersive. You've got, it, it, you hear the, 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 the leaders of the church come and they give notices and there's prayers and meditations and Gothic hymns and a full sermon. It's, it's kind of like a proper church service just with vampires and werewolves fitted <laughs> in, <laughs> which, which might sound crazy, um, but it's the sort of thing that would have really appealed to me. And um, I've been amazed to find that it's, seems to be appealing to others too. Okay, so it's certainly the most creative idea I've ever heard of church services and as <laughs> also goes along to church. I was trying to come up with, you know, exciting new ideas. So uh, you certainly nailed that one. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the response to it has been? Well, I mean, the response has been, uh, you know, in a way I kind of, I guess it's meaningful to me. I, I expected other people to not, to, to view it as fun and, and just as like comedy and drama and a bit of music. But I also thought I won't be surprised if there might be people who will actually find this helpful because um, for some people, you know, they, they, they've never had an experience of maybe going to a church and had the helpful side of that. In fact, 
a lot of people have been to real church and have found it to be a horrible place, you know, a place that has um, turned them away or treated them with prejudice or, or they've been hurt in the past and so they wouldn't dream of going to church. Or, of course, they might not even believe in that sort of thing. And um, I think maybe one of the reasons why the response to this has been good is because it's not, and it really isn't, a kind of Trojan horse conversion technique. Before I, was a, before I went to church um, in my early 20s, uh, be, un, until I was about 21, I never went to church. And I was very um, suspicious of Christians and antagonistic towards them because I just thought they didn't care about me. They just want to convert me to their worldview. So I never went to church. And I'm, I'm still conscious of that with other people that people might think something like Creepy Cove is this clever kind of under the radar thing to get people in because they like spooky things. And once they get in there, well, I'm going to like convert them or evangel uh, evangelize them or that sort of thing. And that's just not really what it's about. It's supposed to be a safe space to explore spirituality, whether you believe in God or whether you're an atheist. And actually a lot of the people who respond to this show seem to be um, atheists. And yet they contact me and say, I'm really appreciating having some time to pray. Um, even though I might not even believe I'm praying to something or entity or a God, it's helping me, um, that sense of community. So yeah, so the response has been deep <laughs> as well as fun, uh, which, which delights me because I find it both deep and, and fun at the same time. Yeah, that's brilliant. You mentioned in the trailer that um, you have um, characters from novels and films turn up at the services. And mm. in particular, you mentioned that um, somebody got chatting with Carrie White from a Stephen King novel. Uh, yeah. From a movie that I saw many, I think it was probably the first horror movie I ever saw. <laughs> oh, wow. It's, yeah, yeah Carrie by Stephen King. It's, that's yeah, a, a, it's a wonderful book, yeah. really good book. So and the next... What yeah, with her chatting with the character. Well, I mean that that this is a good example of like I quite like sort of um, like I write fiction, but I quite like the idea of kind of blended fiction that sort of fuses in with reality. So you sometimes can't fully tell the difference. So this is clearly not a real church, and yet it feels like a real church sometimes. And so sometimes, like each week at the services, we have a horror movie character who will be present. And so the big thing about Carrie White in the, in the book, in the film, Stephen King's Carrie, is she is bullied um, for most of the film and uh, it's really tragic. And then she goes to her school prom and things don't go well at the prom. So for the first episode of Creepy Cove, she came to church and she was there and she talks there and, and she's present. And during that week, um, we decided to live tweet um, her. She would come into the church office and people at home would contact and ask her questions and give her advice on what to wear for the prom and how to use your hair and how to do your hair and that sort of stuff. But it's just me. It's me typing away, pretending to be Carrie White. Everyone knows this. And what seems like a, like a silly, stupid thing was actually quite profound because she gets bullied. There were moments in that where people were sharing their own experiences of being bullied. And at one point I saw somebody write on line, I can't believe I'm sitting here in tears talking to Carrie White about my bullying and her bullying. And, and this, I suppose this is my point about, I think fiction and fictionalized ideas can can actually be very like very powerful, um, especially if we don't insist that they stay in the box of the book or the or the film. Sometimes when we allow them to spill into our lives like this, well, I, I find them really helpful, and and other people seem to be. So yeah, so so guests come in, and sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's serious. Like we had there's a famous film by David Cronenberg called The Fly that was originally a Vincent Price film called The Fly where man, you know, goes through an experiment and gradually turns into a fly, which is not very pleasant. But in that, um, he was in sharing, in, in one of the services, sharing about what it was like to turn into a fly. And at one point, pe somebody comes in the church and tries to chase him down with a giant fly swatter. And it's just all like slapstick comedy for a while. But then very soon after that happens, there's a moment of, there's like a minute of silence 
uh, so that everyone in the church can stand in solidarity with anyone out there who is also going through a physical illness where they feel their body is rebelling against them. And people saying that that has power. Do you know what I mean? So uh, there's this, this surrealism and stupidity and immature humor mixed with really moments of depth. And it's all bunched together. And it seems to resonate with some people. Yeah, that's really fantastic. I love that mix of how you're taking fiction and creating a safe space. And then people are just... Um, able to be who they are and to open up in in that way so yeah. you know that's I mean one of the things I love about fiction is just you identify with characters and you learn and you grow and yeah so it's really, really cool yeah and with fiction as well because I, I like immersion and so um, you know when I listen when I'm reading a book I tend to be listening to appropriate kind of soundtrack music to get me in that zone. Sometimes when I was a kid and I used to read books, you know, like Stephen King or HP Lovecraft or other books like that as a, as a teenager, a young teenager, I would, I wouldn't just read them. I would play spooky music. I would open up my window and I'd sit on the, the windowsill so that I would only read it by the light of the street lamp. And so I had wind in my hair and then I was kind of getting immersed in this world. It was, um, you know, other people would find it a little bit too excessive, but for me, the, the full experience, the experiential stuff, I just get a kick out of. Yeah. Brilliant. So we have a first question from um, somebody on the call, which is, oh, it's Poppy. Poppy wants to know um, which author or book would you say is your biggest influence following on from that conversation um i mean I, I, there's there's various ones um and i, I do i do like hp lovecraft who was um there was an author who was writing kind of more famous in the sort of 20s and wasn't wasn't really well known in his lifetime and uh, but now is is just so so popular and really appeals to young people in, in particular but i i'd be lying if i didn't say Fundamentally, I think Stephen King still has the, 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 the biggest influence because so many of his books and his films um, are the ones that I encountered as a, as a, as a youth, you know, as a, as a child. And they have resonated. And, you know, I could list so many horror films I love or characters and that. And then you go, oh, that one's Stephen King. That one's Stephen King. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it's cliche to say him. And there's plenty of others, you know, like James Herbert and other people like that. But uh, yeah, it, Stephen King and Stephen King characters do crop up a fair amount in Creepy Cove, but others, others do too. But yeah, I'd say Stephen King. And pet, oh, you asked me what book? What book? Um, I loved Salem's Lot. I thought Salem's Lot was fantastic because partic- and, and also the TV adaptation with David Soul, Starsky and Hutch guy. Um, I thought that was an amazing adaptation. But I love the idea of, again, it was bringing the, what Bram Stoker had and Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula was a stunning book. But, you know, what, what Salem's Lot did was bring all of that kind of gothic uh, you know, for, foreign pestilence of the vampire and put it into the small town, uh, the everyday. And that, that creeped me out. And Pet Cemetery as well. I, I thought that book, that book scared me, Pet Cemetery did. So, which meant I loved it. <laughs> So, so was it reading that kind of book that got you into scary things in the first place, or was it something else? Um, it was a combination of those things. Um, but I think, I think what got me interested in these these books, but also these topics and these films, was ambition for a bigger world. I I think that's where that came from. You know that I I wasn't a person who was was into sports or football and things like that so if if i was at school and you know everyone was getting excited about a football game or whatever i tr- i tried to fit in you know and i bought the the panini album of the sticker album the football sticker album so maybe i'd fit in that way and i'm like this doesn't excite me because it's not epic enough but then i'd go to the library and i'd uh, pop to the 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 shelf that said the unexplained or the paranormal. And there's all these stories about ghosts and poltergeists and UFOs and Bigfoot and the Yeti and all this sort of subjects. And then I'd go to the video library because I'm old enough to be in VHS world. And there'd be all these films on the shelf that would be about, this was kind of 
the video nasties stage as well with like monsters and cannibals and all these sorts of, oh my word, just such graphic stuff. But it, what it did with me, it made suddenly the whole world seem much more epic. Um, it meant that if I was to look at a, just a house on the street, walking to school, let's say in the normal world, a little house on the, the, the corner is just, oh, that's a nice semi-detached house. But, but then I'd read a book about the paranormal and I'd say, who knows, that house could be haunted. That house could have like a doorway into a completely different plane of existence. And that to me kind of heightened my sense of consciousness. <laughs> it, it made everything epic. It turned all the colors up of my entire hometown. And that to me was exciting. And I think it, that in essence is the same search for spirituality, really. You know, it's looking for something beyond the physical cool. and ambition to find that. Yeah. But do you find that a lot of people consider that horror and um, faith would be mutually exclusive? How do you handle that sort of um, criticism, which I'm sure you do get at times? So. Yeah, I, I do get that. And um, I can understand it. it. It makes sense to me that uh, for some people, if they don't think about it enough, that it just seems like a no-brainer that um, a Christian, and particularly an ordained minister, should be like of the light and just think about the light and then actually on the other side of it is the it's the weirdos and the the dysfunctional poss possibly killers and violent people who are drawn to the morbid but i think when you really look into it and when you when you actually think about it it's it's just not that cut and dried uh, we don't live in a world that is purely 100% happy and i'm not the type of person who can run away from real topics but i'm also a coward in that i don't necessarily want to address the topics directly so some people think for me like oh if i write novels in which people get killed horribly um it must mean that i get excited and kind of rub my knees in a thrilling way when i hear about a real murder on the news or something i'm like oh this is exciting it's it's the complete opposite i find all that stuff so disturbing and distressing that um horror has been a way of me to um, get in control of those things, to um, get, get, get them in a, in, a, in a way that I can organize. And that gives me courage and confidence. So it's similar to in, in a book I wrote called The Frighteners, which is a um, nonfiction book about why we're drawn to the macabre and defending why we are. There's a chapter in it about children. And in that, there's a bit where children in the weeks and months after 9-11 were children who had had parents who were killed in those terrorist attacks. They were witnessed building Lego towers and building Lego planes and smashing them into each other over and over. And people around them were like, what's wrong with you? You're trivializing a terrible event. And we're going to try and get them to stop that until child psychologists were saying, no, you need to let those people continue because otherwise, um, you know, this is, this is the way they are trying to take the chaos of the real horror of the world and put it into a manageable way. And it might look horrific to you, but something deep's going on. So for me, it, it's normal. It, it makes sense. It's a coping mechanism. It's a way of escape and all these other things. But if people haven't thought about it that much, I think they come along and they just go, you must like people when they get murdered. <laughs> and that's really not what Christianity is about, is it? And so they make that kind of binary um, decision. And also, of course, for some Christians, particularly evangelicals, they'll see uh, that they'll be much more um, hyper aware or scared, perhaps, of the potential of, of the demonic, you know, of like devils and demons being on the march. And so we'll say, well, look, if you watch, say, The Exorcist, for example, you are opening your opening yourself to um, to to satanic power, and uh, so that film, you know, has been described as a uh, as having evil in the very celluloid itself, and that Christians should avoid it. And yet, ironically, that film was banned in Tunisia on the basis of it being Christian propaganda, yeah. because it is so clearly in support and pro religion because in that film the it's very blasphemous of course it's about the 
the demonic possession. But th- it was films like that that got me thinking about faith, even when I wasn't a Christian, because they were presenting a world where the supernatural was real and there was an answer. So yeah, so some people struggle with it. And I, I understand that. And I've ha- I have had situations, actually. I got interviewed on a Christian radio station once where um, the, the presenter um, was clearly not, not keen on what I was into. She, she really thought, she thought Harry Potter was demonic. So, you know, when she, she saw the stuff that was on my bookshelf, she'd uh, <laughs> call the exorcist for me. Um, and what she did was uh, I discovered later when I just happened to offhand chat to a producer who I knew he was connected with the station and he'd said, um, Oh, you know, she, she sent around an email. there's millions of us like that of of fiction you can get and um the crimes in crime fiction isn't the non-payment of fines <laughs> it's it's murder um and so as a culture we've always addressed the morbid and the macabre in these sorts of ways and i and i and i i get defensive uh, for those others who have done this and are drawn to this stuff and who might think particularly if they're in church you might think there's something wrong with them or that even that they've got latent evil in them. And I want to say to them, no, you're really quite normal. And you're just trying to get through this world like everyone else and try to make sense of it. And sometimes morbid culture helps you do that. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I read very recently, last week, I think, uh, there was an article in one of the newspapers saying how people have this need to be frightened and this need to look at the dark because actually that helps, well, as you've just said, to process um, all of that side of stuff and to feel in control of it to a certain extent. So, yeah. And, and also not to, not to feel like a fraud, um, you know, to like an example would be it's coming up to Halloween. I'm doing a bunch of um, BBC radio interviews on Sunday about Halloween. And um, I just, they sent me the questions before and it was things about, well, do Christian churches, they put on something called a lights party at Christmas time. And it's an alternative to Halloween where um, basically the encouragement is, well, kids, you shouldn't be listening. You shouldn't be thinking about spooky dark things at Halloween because that's, that's of the devil. You should be thinking of happy things. So we put on a lights party where no one's allowed to dress as a zombie or anything, but you probably come dressed as, I don't know, the Roman centurion who executed Jesus, (laughs) like Moses or something or, or Noah you know, who witnessed the, the death of the whole world through a flood. And so, you know, those sorts of inherently dark ideas, but they become sanitized. And, um, and we'll say, well, that's the answer. And it may be the answer for those people who don't want to think about reality. But for the rest of us, and including children, I think they need to have opportunities to, en- to engage in a safe way with the stuff that's scary. Um, that's one of the great things about having a pet in a way. <laughs> it's going to sound really dark, but it's great to have a pet for the companionship. But as, when, when a pet dies, it's, um, I'm not saying that's desirable, that we should arrange that. <laughs> but if it does happen, um, it's sometimes a, it's a safe doorway for a child into what it's like to lose someone. And it's devastating, but it's not as devastating as if they lost their parents, let's say. And... Um, and, and so we've got this move sometimes in the Christian world, but sometimes in the general world of saying, well, children shouldn't be exposed to dark fairy tales. Um, they shouldn't be allowed to have access to the original um, Cinderella, you know, when the, in that, in that story, when the original Cinderella or one of one version of Cinderella, which is when the, the, the sisters are trying to fit their feet into the, the slipper and they can't fit. And so they start getting knives out and start carving sections of their feet off uh, the, the edges of their feet, just so they can fit them in the shoe. This stuff's really twisted, but I think children respond to that stuff either with a bit of fear, but they can learn stuff too. And there's something in my the book, the frighteners where I talk about how um, I told my son 
um, a scary, I kind of sang him a little scary song about, well, it's not that scary, but it's about Yoda from Star Wars and he was scared of Yoda. And I sang, I sang him this Yoda song about seagulls one night and um, he was really scared and he said, stop doing that. And of course I did. The next night he asked me to sing it again. And there are some parents who would say, I'm not going to sing that to you again because you were scared last night and I don't want to give you nightmares. I will protect you from the fear. And then there's other parents, which are more like me, I suppose, that said, that was thinking, wow, you were scared last night. And now you want to go back into that arena and learn courage again and experience that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to shut that down. I want you to be a, to have courage. So I told him it again. And of course, the second he freaks out, you stop. Okay, I'll give you a cuddle. Yoda's not really here. Um, but can you see what I mean? It's like, it, it's a way of us learning courage. The fairy tales and the dark stories are a way of us realizing not everyone is to be trusted. And you can't just, you know, if, if everyone, if, if everyone just, all kids just read the Gruffalo, as nice as that is, or the Hungry Caterpillar and all this stuff, which are brilliant. I've read all those books <laughs> um, to my children and to myself. But, but, you know, it doesn't prepare you, does it, for the reality of the next door neighbor may not be trustworthy. And so you've got to have these stories, subversive stories, just giving you that safe hint to be careful, be wise. And sometimes that wisdom comes through, through fear, controlled fear. I'm not talking about, you know, like sit your kid in front of Silence of the Lambs or something and say, like, watch out, this could be your teacher. There's a, there's a level, an appropriate level I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say one of my favourite quotes is from um, June about fear. Oh, yeah. Fear is the mind killer. It's, um, I've uh, quoted that many a time. So. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that you know, fiction influences real life. So that's yeah. really yeah. good people. Thank you. Um, so you talked about Halloween and dressing up. So Poppy has another question for you related to that, which is, if you could be one of the universal monsters or har horror characters, who would you want to be and why? Poppy, what a great question. <laughs> um, you know what, my favorite, my favorite universal monster is the one that has got the worst outfit and it's the Wolfman. So, <laughs> so I, I love the Wolfman. I love the original Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. It's a beautiful film and it's one of the earliest films that, uh, shows that like the, 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 the sadness of the, of the person who gets turned into a werewolf. So it's great. But, but his outfit is rubbish. Like he's, he, he turns into a werewolf and his shirt is still tucked in. Didn't make sense to me. Um, and he just, they just put yaks hair on his face and did a sort of dis, cross dissolve on his face. And um, so I suppose my favorite would be the Wolfman, but in answer to the question, Dracula, has definitely got the best outfit, like Bella Lugosi. Um, I've, I've got a Dracula outfit somewhere, which I did for a Halloween party. So yeah, I think I'd, it'd have to be um, the full on Dracula with cape and little fangs, but I love the Wolfman. <laughs> Excellent. Um, John, you have a question for Peter. Early on, Peter, you were describing that um, people were maybe mistrustful of a, an ordained um, person offering a frightening experience on, <laughs> on well, in books or, or online. Yeah. Um, but then, as you described it further, I was hearing something which really sounded quite a pastoral experience that you were offering people. Wow. So, I mean, and, and, and then you've gone on to talk about the, uh, the therapeutic um, benefits of children being frightened of their, their worst fears and learning to come to terms with them. But I'm, I'm wondering how much you you know about why people come to Creepy Cove, uh, whether they're coming to be frightened and then are surprised to find that it's pastorally supportive, or whether they come for a pastoral experience because they know you're a vicar deep down. Well, I mean that's interesting. And funny enough, I mean there's a, there's a couple of people in the room who come to Creepy Cove who spotted, and so you know I don't know if anyone would like to answer that. I wouldn't want to put words into your mouth but i've got i've got my own ideas of why people might come but uh if anyone who does listen wants to share why they come um i don't want to put you on the spot but if you'd like to feel free to unmute now 
And if you don't, I'll carry on. Is anybody else going to say anything? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's you, Poppy. <laughs> yeah, the spotlight's on you. Um, Trudy, you muted as well. We'll come to Trudy in a moment. You first. Poppy. Oh, good, Trudy. That's what I thought. Um, it was it's a bit of both, really, because um, I'm also interested in the gothic and the macabre and horror, um, all those kind of things, um, and the spiritual side of things. I've always been interested in faith and religion. I'm not a practicing great Christian. Um, but it's something I'm interested in, so um, it's a bit of both, really, for me. Cool. Trudy, did you want to comment? Uh, yeah, sorry, I know you're probably looking at a black screen, but nobody needs to see what I look like right now. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I find it absolutely fascinating how Peter can marry the church with horror. It's obviously something I've never come across before. And um, I'm not easily scared, not by monsters and that sort of thing. True life scares me. Um, mm. But I also really enjoy the, um, the moments that you give for reflection and prayer. Although like I, I'm agnostic, so I don't pray, but I do use those mo moments to think about what you're talking about and I do really appreciate that time. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That that's that's really encouraging. Thank you. And um, I think. Can I uh, say sorry. Yes. Yeah. Can I say something, Peter? Yeah, of course. Do please. Um, I come well. I'd, I'm a couple behind. <laughs> yeah, as you know, enough. as you know, with that looking after mum and stuff. But um, I listen to it because I actually find it hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And I absolutely love Rupert, right? I just think I could listen to Rupert all day um, because I think he's hilarious. And then I love the way that you intertwine the, the, the snippets of the actual horror films in to it, which then makes us think, oh, I fancy watching that film again. But then when it mm. comes to the sermon, then that's like, wow, there's some things in there that I think, crikey, yes. You know, that, that make, it's just how, how you put it all together. It's, it is, it's like humour, nostalgia with the films. And then actually, mm. yes, that's, that's actually something that I can relate to in the sermon. So that's what I love about it. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Well, thank you. So um, sometimes, um, sometimes I'm slightly conflicted about the whole thing. Um, in so, let me explain what I mean. In that, I, I, I think, you know, are people like are people going to be bothered about the sermon and that bit? Is that not just going to be really boring? Or are people who would like that bit not be really bored by all of these kind of niche horror references? Which because because I, I I remember when I'm in when I go to church and like the the minister starts like making jokes and references to like rugby or football or something, my mind just switches off and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not into that. If they talk about music, I'm like, all right, I'm in the zone or films. And so I think, you know, are people just going to get turned off by one thing or the other? But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's encouraging to know that, that people seem to connect with, with, with a kind of mixture of both, um, which, which means a lot. I do think that maybe, um, one of the things that is helpful is that sometimes Christianity hasn't really got, <laughs> hasn't really got a very good reputation. Um, and I I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that I'm changing that. Um, what I'm saying is uh, increasingly, it seems that to be a Christian is to be defined by what you're against and who you hate and who you want to cancel. And that I find depressing um, because that's not what I've discovered w with having, having faith, but equally as well, I'm quite open about, I, I'm kind of radically open in terms of my own faith. And I think that maybe people appreciate that. So for example, sometimes people get shocked at me when I say 
hey, maybe God doesn't exist because <laughs> he might not. You know, like that to me is the nature of faith. It's, it's entirely possible that I'm, my quest for the epic <laughs> has all been just this looking for comfort or a delusion or that I'm suffering from what's called apophenia, which I talked about in my second novel, which is the, the relentless finding of patterns that aren't actually there. You know, like when you see a plug and a plug's upside down, you go, oh, it's a face. But we do that on a psychological level um, where we go, oh, you know, I wanted a car park space and I prayed and I got one or I met my wife and in that place. And, if I, and we read patterns into things. I'm quite, I think it's quite possible to hold those th two things in tension. On one hand, it's possible I could be wrong, but it's also possible I could be right. And the, the right version is the, is the one that really fulfills me personally. I don't expect other people to be fulfilled by it. That's up to them, but it fulfills me. And it means something to me. And so even though I can intellectually fall off the horse one way or the other, I do think I, I, my feet point in the direction of faith and not because of a lack of evidence. You know, so I mean, not, I, I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm not one of these people who say believe in God and all that. Faith is belief in the invisible without any evidence. I, I, I'm moving that direction because I think there's evidence that there may well be something else. There may well be an organizer behind evolution and those sorts of things. But I don't have a problem with them um, being theoretically open to me being wrong. <laughs> and it, but, but I feel like the, the, the more, the more I, I observe society, the more dualistic we become. And so you've, you've got to choose. You're either, you're either a Christian or you're a Muslim, or you're, or you're a believer, or you're, an, or you're an atheist, or you're a conservative, or you're Labour, or you're Biden, or you're Trump. And it's just, everything's about separation. And, and, and for me, I, I get inspired by, there's a, there's a great Franciscan monk called Richard Rohr, who's one of his most kind of famous books is called Falling Upwards. And he describes how life is split into two sections. The, it's like two boxes almost. He says the first part of your life is like black and white. Everything has to make sense and you need that to survive. So when you're young, your parents say, don't talk to strangers or, you know, be careful when you cross the road. Or if you're from a religious background, it might be Muslims are going to hell or Christians aren't the right ones or Catholics aren't, haven't have got it wrong. And you've got all of these very strict frameworks. And then when you grow up, you start getting data, which challenges the frameworks. So you start going, you know what? I know I got taught that maybe Muslims um, were not, didn't have the true way or something. This is just an example, theoretical example. But I've, I've, I've got a Muslim colleague at school, at, at work, and he's absolutely lovely. And he does, and he's so kind hearted. And I sense spirituality in him. Richard Raw says, you go from the first box into the second box. And this is where people have to make a decision. They basically, the world becomes less black and white and it starts to become a bit more gray. Some people respond to that with panic and they think, oh my word, I've lost my way. I'm losing my faith. But others like Raw would say, start to think what happens if this is what spiritual maturity is of being willing to be honest and say, sometimes I'm not fully sure what the answer is. And I've got more and more confident in being gray in some ways because I don't fully know what the answers are for everything. I don't want to presume for other people, particularly when so many ideas about faith are based on specific verses that if you look in different translations, and I did, a, did Greek at, Spurgeon's, uh, sorry, um, at Bible college, and sometimes that can really change the emphasis of certain verses. So for me, um, there's, there's a liberation in being yourself and honest and sometimes that's, I don't think, I don't think we're dualistic people. I just don't think we're always one thing or the other. I think everyone's this fascinating bundle of contradictions and complications, but that's what human beings are. I think that was, a, that was a bit of a going off on one there. Sorry, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I think people may be comfortable um, with that, that I'm willing to just be like, have the heart on the sleeve. But I do think that some, maybe some Christians would struggle with that because they would have that second, they, they would want to have the black and white thinking for their whole lives. 
And so they would say, you've got to be much more clearer. Um, you've got to be much more specific. And they would struggle perhaps with my views. Uh, I think it's really refreshing, Peter, your willingness to explore and to, to not, not claim to have a, all the answers, to know everything. So, yeah, mm. I find that really encouraging. Um, changing the subject slightly, but keeping it on the, the theme of exploration. Um, so when you book, wrote your book, The Frighteners, which you mentioned earlier, which defends this interest in the dark side of life, um, you actually travelled quite a bit to do research for that, didn't you? You went to Transylvania, which I'm very jealous about. It's one of the places I'd love to visit. And uh, oh, as soon as lockdown ends, that was amazing. I'm, I'm heading that way. Uh, you went to Rome, which I have been to, and it's awesome. Loved Rome. Mm -hmm. And also right across Britain. Oh, Why don't you gorgeous. tell us a little bit about your experiences of research and travel? Oh, I'm, Sharon, I'm telling you, right, like writing that book was like one of the blessings of my life um, because I can't believe I got to do that. <laughs> um, I got to stay in a nice hotel in the Carpathian mountains, you know, and um, got to go on a werewolf hunt in Hull <laughs> with a historian, <laughs> which is so random. Um, the, that book, The Frighteners, it kind of explores lots of different aspects of the macabre and defends it so from the paranormal interest to monsters to um, the psychology of fear and children and fear. Um, and yes, uh, it involved, I didn't want to just write a kind of dry textbook. I wanted to have some adventures. So um, I, so, you know, in the chapter which explores zombies and monsters, for example, I was able to arrange to go to Calverton nuclear hatch, um, nuclear bunker, uh, sorry, Calvin and Hatch nuclear bunker, sorry. Um, which is this amazing, uh, has anyone ever been to that? It's, it's amazing. It's, um, it's in Essex and uh, it's an underground nuclear bunker that was there for devolved government in the kind of 80s during the Cold War, but then it's no longer used for that. But it's now a, a, a place you can visit. And you go through this little cottage above above the, the, the floor, above the ground, and then you just go down and down about, and then you end up in this massive nuclear bunker, which is amazing. And so I was able to go down there at nighttime and um, get chased by people dressed as zombies for about an hour and a half, <laughs> where I I had to find attache cases with um, with syringes in it, which would protect me from their bite. Um, and I had guns and I had a gun and me and these other guys had guns and shooting these zombies while they attacked us. It was absolutely, it was amazing. I, I loved it. And, um, and with the book, yeah, I went on this werewolf hunt because there was a werewolf spotted in Hull a few years ago. Um, by about eight different witnesses. I'd not necessarily saying I believe it was a werewolf, but I was interested in all the people who were interested in it. And so the historian and I um, went there and he took me to the places where this wolf was spotted. And I thought it would be a good idea to go to Sainsbury's and buy some peppered steak so we could wrap a bit of string around it. And so it was me and this historian walking up and down, dragging this steak to try and entice this werewolf out. Um, <laughs> That book was crazy. There was and 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 yes, being in Transylvania and uh, you know, interviewing the daughter of a village wise woman and um, a part of that was 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 really fantastic, and just lots of things like that. There was a bit in the book about the psychology of fear where I did some stuff with the BBC where um, blindfolded me and some others and took me in this car into the middle of well, I didn't know where I was to this mansion where this, well, like a sort of country home mansion thing, where uh, uh, somebody who said she was a witch and a one-eyed butler <laughs> invited us into the house. This was after the driver freaked out and ran off and sc screaming. And it was just so when we got abandoned in the middle of this drive and then went into this house and this one-eyed butler and the witch, which in inverted commas put us through scary experiences for over the evening from having spiders thrown at us at dinner time to being strapped to electric chairs and being electrocuted when we got general question, general knowledge questions wrong um, to uh, being forced to take our shoes and socks off and walk on fire. It was proper cool. <laughs> it was, just, it was, it was such a delight to be 
allowed to do these bizarre things. And I think this is my point in some ways about these topics. People look at these topics and they think, well, they're obviously bad because they celebrate the darkness and they bring people down. But no, I think these topics for certain millions of us, they help us deal with the darkness and they actually exhilarate. And they, if you, if you, if you, see, if you, um, if you see somebody who comes out of a horror film, let's say, um, normally they, they're excited, but they're exhilarated. They've got that sense of, I've just survived something. <laughs> um, and that, that is a positive experience. And I find that for the people who are interested in morbid things, their quest is fundamentally a positive quest for adventure, for comfort, for mind expansion, for community. Watching a, watching a horror film in a cinema with other people is one of the most communal experiences you'll have in the cinema. Um, I went to see Friday the 13th part four with my granddad at, um, at a holiday camp. And uh, it was just a diff- it was just completely different from watching a normal film because people are screaming and everyone's laughing after the murders are happening. You know, it's, 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 pos- it's actually a positive thing because pe- real people aren't dying, of course. You know, and that's the difference. This is, this is the bit that kind of gets silly, I think, where people say violence on screen equates to real life violence when it's completely different. And we've always used art throughout human history to address these sorts of topics. And it's an improvement because in the gladiator times, we'd go and watch real people getting killed. Uh, we watch actors getting killed now. So to me, that's progress. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It was just making me think, actually, there's a lot of um, talk in literary worlds now about um, white authors shouldn't write about um, being black and men shouldn't write as other women and all of that sort mm. of thing. But, which is really interesting because clearly you're writing about you know, a supernatural thing, but I presume you don't ever get accused of, of that cultural appropriation in any sort of way. What it, I've never been asked that question before. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't actually um, ever been, you know, said you, you can't write about ghosts if you don't have a haunted house or <laughs> something like that. Um, but uh, that. next time somebody says to me, you know, you can't write about being black because you're not. I'm going to say, but Peter Laws writes about being writes about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, his last book was about possession, but he's not possessed, mind <laughs> you. That that radio presenter would disagree with that. Um, no, I mean, I I think um, I think some some people prefer to stay in their zone, um, and then some people get exhilarated by going over the border. And um, I am a person who likes to go across the border because um, fundamentally, I think human beings are there. And um, I like human beings. I think they're interesting. And um, maybe this is the pastoral thing, John, that you mentioned earlier. Um, I don't often think of myself as a very caring person. I'm quite a selfish person in so many different ways. And um, I can be really quite uncaring in, in, in some ways, like not being that bothered about things. But look, my sister's nodding her head. Um, but uh, but I, I do I do keep finding myself wanting to value people. As in, like with the work I do, I want I I, I hate the idea of like a Christian being known as being the person who stood on the corner and shouted at people and said, "You're all scumbags." Um, I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. I, this Jesus going to everyone, including the rejects and having problems actually with the religious people being quite progressive and subversive, that, that appeals to me. <laughs> so a question from Trudy that kind of ties into that is um, she's assuming that you needed to do quite a bit of training to become a, a minister. And um, when you did that, were you open at that time about your love of horror? And is so... Oh. How, how did people at Bible College react? That's a good question because um, there was a period where I um, I tried to go cold turkey from horror, um, and that was when I I was growing up really into horror, 
And then I, and then when I became a Christian and I thought horror actually was, was one of the doorways into me becoming a person of faith. So I saw it as a valuable thing, but when I became a Christian, I did get the impression from quite a lot of people that it just simply wasn't appropriate for somebody to um, be into God and also be into uh, gore. <laughs> so um, I tried to stay away from that stuff for a while and it was horrible. It was weird. It was kind of becoming someone I wasn't. Uh, I remember the, 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 that feeling of, do you know, the Stepford wives, the, the, the book by Ira Levin, but also the film. And that's always resonated with me. The idea that women are told, um, this is who you are. And there's a bit in that film, particularly where the main woman is a photographer and she creates this amazing art through photography. And then at the end of the film, she starts to realize, you know, I'm going to be turned into a Stepford wife and I won't be me anymore. I won't take pictures and I won't be me. That's what she says. And um, during those few years when I tried to act, well, try to not watch horror films or be interested in the spooky stuff, I could just feel myself like, fracturing i don't mean in a i i, I wasn't gonna have a breakdown or anything i don't mean it that way but it's just wrong i just think it's wrong to it, it's right to stop things that are hurting people of course but if it's not hurting anyone and it's actually giving you great meaning i'm not convinced it's wise to throw that away and but i tried and it, it was horrible and i think um at that time people were saying well the devil's out there and the devil will be in blockbuster you know, enticing you to watch the Blair Witch Project, whereas Jesus will be in the other aisle going, no, my child, it's chicken run for you. <laughs> but I don't want to watch chicken run. Um, but do, do you know what I mean? It's, but it's like, oh, well, I suppose that's where I should go. I'll get chicken run out. And that affects your view, not only of yourself, but of God. You know, and it's like, pff, God's not really my type of person but I guess I'll get on board with this at some point. And um, it, was, it was actually at Bible college. When I went there, I did my master's thesis in exploring kind of the, the horror in the Bible and the biblical ideas in horror films. And it was during that, I was like, hang on a minute. If, if God's really not into expressing things in dark ways, then we're going to need to edit quite a considerable amount of the Bible because the Bible has some pretty horrible stuff in there. And God seems willing to express deep ideas through very dark colors. And I started to think, you know, maybe that's what us humans do. Sometimes we, we express very profound ideas and sometimes that's through light and sometimes it's through darkness, but there's not many people out there who only want to consume pure darkness. You know, you know, who out there wants to sit and watch execution videos over and over? I mean, I'd worry about those people if that's all they watch. Let's just watch someone getting executed. But what about the other people who say, I will never watch the news. If you tell me a sad story, don't tell me that sad story. That's not really healthy. Um, and in The Frighteners, the book, I, I talk about a tribe called the Gabusi tribe who they were, um, they were like a kind of a great example of what it would be like to have a society that never did anything horrible. So they, they never had any violence in their rituals. Um, you know, there was never like no cutting of the skin or anything like that. They never told each other stories which involved violence. And um, they were basically a kind of you certificate community. And you would think then, oh, that, that's what we should try and get and have. But the Gabusi tribe also have one of the highest homicide rates on the planet because they, de they don't deal with this stuff in safe ways. And because they don't, it frequently explodes into real world homicide. And so um, it was when I was at Bible college, I started to think, you know what, maybe this is okay. Not just okay, maybe this is a healthy and helpful. And some people found that strange, but a surprising amount of people found it okay. I mean, in the Christian world, surprising amount thought it was fine and, and it made sense to them. 
Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I always remember when I was um, part of a youth group many, many years ago, and Lord of the Rings had just come out. It was the sort of a, it was the version that was part live, part. Um, Oh, animation. Animated, yes. Yeah, it's late 70s. And yeah. My youth group was absolutely horrified that uh, this had been put out there. It was in the cinema and banned us all from going, which, of course, immediately meant that we all went. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, Tolkien is just amazing. So, uh, but yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, Tol and Tolkien's a good example, or C.S. Lewis, you know, who can have some like dark ideas. Um, but because the source of that is a Christian, you know, some Christians say, oh, well, that's okay, then that's permitted. Or like, you know, Christians can actively encourage people to go and see a film like Passion of the Christ, which I think is a, is a really good film and a really stunning film in many ways, but it is a gore fest. It's, it's one of the most brutal cinema films, mainstream Hollywood films you'll see. And yet the feeling is, ah, but, you know, it's possible for this to be transcendent because it comes from a Christian source. And that, that demonstrates a certain spirituality which says the world is split into secular and spiritual. So when you go to church, you're doing something spiritual. And when you watch Strictly Come Dancing, you're doing something secular. Um, that, that is not, I think, the way the world works, not according to the, the Bible, at least, that the world is a whole bundle of these things, that everything is bundled up together. You don't, you know, it's not like you go to church and hang out with God and then you go home and then God's sitting there waiting for you the next week for an hour. You know, I think spirituality is threaded all over the place. And if it is, it means that and potentially you can hear the voice of God through not just Lord of the Rings, but, um, you know, maybe through Jurassic Park, <laughs> you know, which isn't necessarily a Christian story, but it still explores the fundamental ideas of what it means to be human. So, yeah, I, I think for some Christians, there's a, there's a very kind of small buffet available of art that can give them support. Whereas I think, uh, in my opinion, it's it's all it, it's all out there, and it's when you start looking, you'll see God's fingerprints on more things than you expect if you believe in God. That is. So talking of things being bundled together, Dave wants to know if it's possible to write without being compassionate. I suppose uh, compassionate to your characters or just compassionate in real life? Dave, why don't you comment? <clears throat> I meant in, in real life. I mean, you were, you were talking earlier about empathy mm. um, and fiction. Reading fiction is a, is a way of us understanding human beings that might otherwise be outside our lived experience. Well, I was thinking more in terms of flipping that. And, and to me, it, surely it's necessary to be compassionately interested in, in your fellow man and, and, and obviously your fellow woman to write convincing fiction. Mm. I, I think it helps to be compassionate um, because then you'll be willing to see it from the other point other person's point of view but i suppose it's the motivation for the for, for it so um in in a way you know I, if i wanted to i suppose i could write a story about what it's like for you know someone to go through loss and really take a lot of interest in how to write that but i may my motivation may simply be because i just want to get that right um rather than i care about the person involved um an example would be like psychopathy, you know, people who are psychopaths. And um, Nicole Kidman was interviewed once because she played a psychopath in the film The Human Stain um, mm. with Anthony Hopkins alongside. And um, she, she was interviewed because they said to her, like the interviewer said, well, how, how did you figure out how to be a psychopath? Like, what, is it, what, is it, what does it mean? What did you study and learn? Um, and she said, well, I spoke to someone who told me this is what a psychopath does. A psychopath would walk along and would see somebody, like let's say a, a, a mom and their kid gets hit by a car and the mom is sort of screaming and, and upset, obviously really horrible. You and I um, would probably see that and we would take in all that data of what's 
what's happening. But at the same time, our hearts would be breaking or we'd be, we'd be overflowing with empathy. We would maybe be upset ourselves. We would maybe turn away because we couldn't cope with it. But Kidman was told what a psychopath will do is they will go home and they'll look in the mirror and they will start to recreate the facial expressions of the woman who lost their child. Because to them, it is almost like an academic exercise. It's just like, I'm just interested in recreating what happened. So I, I think it's possible to, you know, like fake, I, I wouldn't even say it's faking compassion, but you could read, you could read something and you'd say, wow, that's so compassionate because they have nailed, really nailed what it's like to, to suffer loss. But unless you know what the motivation of the person is, it's possible. They just did it in a very technical way. Um, yeah, it, it's it's karaoke grief. Oh, what a great Dave! Come on, you should write a book about that karaoke <laughs> grief. That's beautiful. Wow, yeah, and 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 also, and again, I, I wouldn't be swift to condemn the person who struggles to empathise with others. I find myself empathising a fair amount, particularly if I see someone cry. That's my fast track to empathy. If, if someone does my head in, I just kind of visu- sit there and visualize them crying and it makes me feel more empathy for them. But some people don't empathize that quickly. And um, I don't think that means they're a bad person. I just, re- I just read, a gr- uh, there's a comedian, a Scottish comedian I like called Limmy. And he's considered to be quite, a, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's sort yeah. quite offensive, but I think he's so funny. I think it's hilarious. And I just read his book and he was just talking about how he wasn't sure if he was a psychopath or not because like when his mom died, his dad told him and he was like, not bothered. He was yeah. like, well, it's, it's sad. You know, I'm, I'm very gutted, but I don't feel gutted. I just know what it's like to lose someone. And um, like, that's just the way his brain works. And I, I wouldn't want to condemn him because yeah, not, he doesn't I- gush with empathy. And also that that's a situation where you're kind of you're kind of told you should be utterly grief stricken because your mum's died. Yeah. And actually it's down to the relationship that that person had with their mum. And they may not well be that that gutted if it had been a, a difficult well, or a really awkward relationship. Yeah. Well, that's true. But I suppose what I found interesting about Limmy was that he actually did have a good relationship with his mum. But he just found himself, he just didn't, he didn't feel the emotions. Right. The emotions didn't come, but he was respectful and he went to the funeral and he knew it was a big deal. Whereas, you know, if I experience that or, you know, um, or if, if something bad happens to people I love, I have that natural empathy which comes. But I don't think we should grab onto our empathy as if it's some sort of, uh, you can't, you know, check me out because I care about people. <laughs> Sometimes that, you know, aren't I a good person? Sometimes that's purely down to how your brain's brain works. And um, sometimes the condemnation of um, serial killers, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to defend serial killing, of course, but you can't just put yourself on the same level and say, well, that person's evil because they, um, they murdered people. Um, mm. You just, Oh, you don't know what happened in their past. You don't know what, how their brain has worked. You know, some of them lack certain chemicals. So they have any empathy whatsoever. Um, it's not the same playing field for everybody. Um, but uh, but em- I think empathy is the answer, by the way. I think, you know, that black and white thinking that we have for ourselves, the problem is we slot everyone else into those categories. And um, more and more, particularly with social media, it's, you know, echo chambers and, everyone watching their own version of the news. Um, mm. And the answer, I think, is empathy. Yeah. But not everyone gets that. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you. Folks, the time has really flown by. Um, if you've got any questions, oh. just quickly get them into the chat box, particularly if you've got any questions about Peter's crime fiction series um, and Matt Hunter, because I'm aware we haven't actually... Uh, mentioned that at all. Oh, yeah. It's one of the things Peter is most well known for. <laughs> but that's fine. But actually, uh, Peter, yeah. I wanted to just give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about what is coming up in Creepy Cove, because obviously Halloween is just around the corner, but also Christmas is not that far away. And I know yeah. it's all over the place. We're trying to figure out what to do Christmas in lockdown. What's happening at Creepy yeah. Cove? <laughs> Well, I mean, Creepy Cove goes, is, goes in seasons. And so the first season.
Christmas, <laughs> dysfunctional <laughs> and strange and fun. Um, and then, then, and then the new series uh, starts in January. Um, but I, I also have a pay, something called a Patreon, um, which is, uh, you know, some, some of you guys here are members of the Patreon, which is why I think you're amazing. And um, what that is, is where people kind of pay a little bit of money where they have access to extra things. And I, and that stuff's still ongoing. So I have a, a podcast that comes out every week called the Peter Laws podcast, which explores strange news and uh, bizarre stories, not only from the paranormal world, but there's a section in that called Holy Moly where I specifically explore the strange things that are going on in the Christian world at the moment. And there's loads of stuff going on there, but that's not always reported on <laughs> things like, you know, the conspiracy theories about uh, and the Q and non movement and all this sort of stuff to do with the election. Um, the, uh, the songs of creepy cove, I'm planning on putting that together as a, as an album. <laughs> so the, the horror hymns of creepy cove volume one should be coming out uh, soon. Cause there's 10, there's 10 songs now. And um, yeah, so, so there's various things I'm doing. And I was thinking about the sermons, maybe putting them together in a book. And so that people who aren't totally not interested in the horror side of things may be interested in the encouraging sermon bits. So I was thinking about putting those into a book perhaps. But, uh, but yeah, those, those sorts of things I've got on my plate at the moment. Fabulous. I'll be looking out for that. And I know you post a lot about um, what's going on on your Facebook page. So uh, um, I would encourage yes. people if they don't already follow you on Facebook to do so because it's... I, I, I love seeing your posts pop up. Oh, thank so you. I mean, and not, this is going to sound very vague, but I actually this week I was asked to do a write a little writing project for something I'm not even allowed to talk about yet. But it's not a massive thing, but it was such a cool thing to get to do. And um, I'll if you follow me on social media, you'll find out what that is in, in the next couple of weeks, I suppose. But um, what's what's nice is when you when you get known for this weird stuff, um, people ask you to do things that are unexpected. So. Uh, Cool. which which is which is great which i love so to draw things to a close there are two three questions about matt hunter so i'm going to try and mm. roll them all, all into one for our final question that's actually three questions <laughs> which is um what plans do you have for matt and also what is it about matt hunter's life and rabbits where did that come from oh gosh um yeah well um yeah matt Matt Hunter is the character from my crime fiction novels who is an ex-church minister turned atheist professor who helps the police solve religiously motivated crime. Can you tell that I've said that sentence before? <laughs> it's, um, and I love him. He's great, this guy. And I, I, I get on with him because <laughs> in some ways we're slightly similar, although he has a different trajectory to me. And yeah, in the books that he's, he, he enjoys life and he, 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 he's got a happy family. I didn't want to write a crime fiction book where you know, the man was divorced or he was struggling or he's an alcoholic. He's, he's got a great life, happy family. He just has some cosmic issues with, with the church. And um, so he, he helps the police solve crimes when it's related to religion and um, usually Christianity, which is quite strange because sometimes like atheists will get in touch and say, I love this guy because you're willing to write him as an atheist and he's not going to convert or anything. He's just a normal person. And then sometimes Christians come and say, why, why are all the Christians in your book serial killers? <laughs> can't, you, can't you put some nice ones in there? Um, even though I'm a Christian myself. But uh, yeah, the, the next steps for Matt, I'm, I'm not really sure because I took a, a, a break from that. The last book that came out was called Possessed, which is when he was um, he's dealing with a case of demonic possession. Hang on, I've got the book down here. One sec. Um, yeah, it was that, it was that book because... Um, Demonic uh, possession and uh, exorcism is is on the rise or has been on the rise in the last few years. I don't know if you're aware of that, but um, it's really popular. A few years ago, it was fidget spinners. Now it's the ancient ritual of exorcism that everyone wants. No, I'm only kidding. But no, it is it is it is big, um, bigger than ever, really, because uh, more and more people are asking for um, the ritual of exorcism. And there's lots of reasons for that. I talk about those in the book. But once now that that's finished, I've got to work out what to do next. Do I write a completely different novel, um, or do I do another Matt Hunter? I, I just I'm not fully sure yet. But I'm 
this this lockdown things like changed things around. And also, I I mean, speaking honest with you as well, like writing is not the easiest way to make a living. Even though I've got books out in different countries, um, you know, I have to do other stuff, side hustles, some people call them, but you know, I love them. And stuff like Creepy Cove and the Patreon um, are not just a hobby. You know, that's actually a something to help me survive. <laughs> as well as um, creativity and stuff like that. What right. was the other question? It was about rabbits. Oh yeah, rabbits. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, the second novel, Unleashed, which explores, the, which is the scariest, in my opinion, that's the one That's the one that scares me and it scares, it seems to scares, uh, scare other people. Someone came to my door the other day and said they have nightmares about that book, which is great, which is like a chef being told your meal's good. Um, but yeah, in that book, it ex explores, the idea of um, like a symbol of a black rabbit of being this sort of symbol of darkness and this idea, you know, in Watership Down, the, the black rabbit of Inlay who kind of escorts the, the dead rabbits from life into the sort of the hereafter, the rabbit hereafter. And um, in that book and in subsequent books, there's Matt starts to, he feels like he's having these visions of this tall humanoid black rabbit, uh, and that spooks me out because that comes from my own life. Like when I was a teenager, I used to go on ghost hunts with my friends and um, we kind of hopped the wall of this old freaky, not an asylum, but a kind of sanatorium type place and went in there and had this like supernatural experience where I thought I saw this weird kind of humanoid stroke animal rabbit type thing standing on top of a building and ran away. And uh, I talk about that in the book Unleashed at the end of it, which was really scary, but really fascinating and um, became a book, became Unleashed. So yeah, it's the, the Black Rabbit. And obviously there's a book, there's a film called Donnie Darko, which anno annoyingly presents a tall guy with a rabbit's mask on and all that sort of stuff. So this idea of a humanoid rabbit, but uh, yeah, it was when I was, in the 1990s, I suppose, when I started thinking about it. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that, Peter. I won't be going out into my garden this evening now because I'll be looking yeah. my shoulder worrying about rabbits. Well, <laughs> now we've talked about it, it will probably manifest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Just take right. a carrot. Fine. Give me a big old carrot. <laughs> I'd like to thank you hugely for this evening and for sharing so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Hope everybody agrees. Can we just give Peter a Zoom round of applause for uh, joining with us? Thank you so much. Thank it's you. Been really thank awesome. you. Well done, Poot. <laughs> <laughs>